Our next system to study in the human body is the respiratory system. And I've divided this uh, into three different parts so that you just have a little each night. The respiratory system, some of the key concepts to remember over these three lessons are, what does the respiratory system do? How do the parts of the respiratory system work together? And of course, how does the respiratory system interact with other body systems to maintain homeostasis? You need to know these functions of the respiratory system. Of course, the main thing, if you asked why do we need the respiratory system, you think of breathing. It's also a gas exchange. And you can just shorten that second one to gas exchange. And it's a gas exchange between the, at, the gases in the atmosphere and in the blood. In other words, the oxygen moving out of the atmosphere and into the blood and the carbon dioxide moving out of the blood and into the atmosphere. So we're going to learn specifically where in the respiratory system does that take place. So breathing, gas exchange. And the other is preventing, another one is preventing foreign substances from entering during breathing. And so when you, you know, in the air, a lot of times there's dust particles, there can be pollution and all kinds of stuff in the air. And when you breathe in through your nose, mainly, you are going to be preventing a lot of these foreign substances because they're going to get trapped in what we call cilia. And we'll be talking about that tonight. And then, of course, one that you guys, many of you use very well, and so you probably are very happy that you have your respiratory system, and that is phonation, which is speaking. The breathing is the moving of air in and out of your lungs. That's breathing. And we're going to talk about inhalation and exhalation when we get to that slide. Now, breathing is what enables your respiratory system to take in oxygen and to eliminate carbon dioxide. That's why it is both part, your lungs are both part of the digestive system, excuse me, not digestive, the excretory system and your respiratory system because it is excreting carbon dioxide and it is taking in oxygen. Now think about when we've studied something, why, what is the main use, what is, actually what is the only use of that oxygen? Why do we need that oxygen? Where is it going and what is it being used for? We're going to talk about it on the next slide, but I want to see if you can think of it before we go over it because it's something we studied. And then where is that carbon dioxide coming from? that we need to eliminate and get out of our system. It's actually coming from the same process on why we need the oxygen. And that process is called cellular respiration. Aerobic cellular respiration. And where does that oxygen go? It goes, it goes into your cells, into the mitochondrion, the powerhouse of the cell. Because what is needed for cellular respiration is oxygen and glucose. And remember, one of the waste or byproducts of aerobic cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. So that's where all this carbon dioxide is coming from that we need to get out of our system. And we'll learn when we study the blood, but it's the blood that is going to carry that oxygen then to your cells, and then blood's going to carry the carbon dioxide to your lungs. So that's what blood is doing. So every cell in your body needs oxygen for a series of chemical reactions called aerobic cellular respiration. During cellular respiration, oxygen and sugars, glucose, react releasing energy. Remember that energy is the usable energy by the cells called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And that's the energy that the cell can use. So your respiratory system removes carbon dioxide, which is part of the excretory system, and it's removing some other waste gases from your body as well. So breathing in is called inhalation, but another word is inspiration. So inspiration, you can get inspired and get an idea. Uh, that's the same word, but different meanings. 
So one meaning of inspiration is to inhale, to breathe in air. Exhaling or expiration is the opposite. It's breathing the air out. And we'll talk more about how and what muscles are involved with that because your lungs have no muscle whatsoever in them. None. Absolutely no muscle. Now you need to be able to list in order the path that the air takes through the human body. And ideally it's entering through your nose and your nasal cavity. We'll talk about some advantages to that rather than breathing through your mouth. Then it goes through the pharynx. Remember the pharynx is part of both the respiratory system and the digestive system because food goes through the pharynx as well. The larynx, the trachea, bronchi, which is plural, there's two bronchus, so bronchi is plural, then bronchioles and the alveoli. Now our nasal cavity, we're going to go in order. Of course, we're not going to get them all tonight in this uh, one vodcast. But air enters through your nose. Your nose has two nasal cavities because between the two is a dividing wall. And a dividing wall is known as, or something that divides is known as a septum. We'll see it show up in some other areas. One is your heart. So the nasal septum is that part in the middle of your nose that divides your nose into two nasal cavities. Now lining those two nasal cavities are ciliated mucous membrane. And the cilia and the mucus have purposes. Your mouth is not lined with cilia and it's not lined with mucus. Mucus is AKA snot. So it's not the same as spit. Your mouth has spit, saliva in it, but it doesn't have mucus. Mucus is sticky. So the cilia line the nose and most other airways in your respiratory tract. Even your lungs have cilia in it. Your trachea has cilia. The functions of the cilia First of all, they are actually moving. Now they're microscopic, and by the way, the, the hairs on your nose are called cilia as well, but they're not microscopic. So they're, they move, they're wave motions, and they trap any particles in the air. And what they're trying to do is get all that stuff out of the air so it doesn't get into your lungs. That's the purpose. So it's trying to keep those from getting into your lungs. So they move that stuff that they're tracking trapping and they're going to move it away from the lungs out to your nose your mouth the cilia are for catching things now the mucus is sticky so the mucus is going to help those particles that the cilia is trapping out to stick and adhere and not get any further and another very important function and these are two advantages through breathing through your nose rather than your mouth is you're getting that extra filtering and you're getting the air warm and moistened which is very important if you've ever been out and if you ever are out in real real cold weather which we don't get here I'm from up in Indiana and we would have negative wind chill factors one time of like negative 50 so that's real cold. But if you go out in that cold of weather and you breathe through your mouth, you can actually damage your respiratory tract. You're not getting that warming and that moistening of the air. Now, if you look at the picture here, if you look on the right, you can see what look like cilia, those little finger-like projections. And of course, this is with an electron microscope. But see the lower cells that don't have the cilia that are next to it, the, the goblet, those are what actually produce the mucus. So those are the mucus producing cells. Now if anything irritates your nose, it's going to stimulate then your nervous system to start sneezing, causing your nose to sneeze. And that's to try to get all that irritant out of your body. Hey, all right, mucus aka snot, it's a thick sticky substance and it's filtering the air because it's sticky. That stuff is going to adhere to it and not be able to go any further. And then, of course, you blow your nose or you pick, pick your boogers or whatever it is. You'll get those things out. 
right, next the air moves into the pharynx. The pharynx is a tube. You can see on the diagram there. It starts where your nasal cavities end, and it's also in the very back of your mouth. You know, you got that thing hanging down in the back. looks like a little punching bag, which is technically called your uvula. Beyond that, right behind that little punching bag in your, when you're looking down your mouth, that's where the pharynx is. And it goes all the way down to your esophagus and also to the trachea, or the top of the trachea, which is the larynx. So it's a tube-like passage at the top of the throat that receives air, food, and liquids from the mouth and the nose. So that's why it's po part of both the digestive system and the respiratory system. The pharynx, you don't need to know dimensions, like five inches. That's not important for a quiz or a test. It, too, is lined with that ciliated mucous membrane. So it's doing the same thing there. And where it extends from the back of your nose to the esophagus and always also to the top of the larynx is where the air is going to go. But a key thing to know about this little five-inch tube, it is also sometimes referred to as the control center for incoming substances. And that's because it is, again, both part of the respiratory and the digestive system because it's controlling what you drink, what you eat and swallow, and your breathing and trying to get it to go down the right places. Now, you need to know that there are seven openings into or out of our little five-inch tube, the pharynx. Two of them are the nasal cavities that we just talked about. Two of them are little tiny tubes called eustachian tubes. And they are little passages from the pharynx up to the middle ear. They're normally closed. You may say, well, why do we need these? Why do we have these little tubes that go up into our middle ear? They're actually for equalizing air pressure. So when you're traveling up a mountain and down a mountain and your ears start popping and all that kind of stuff, uh, and you yawn. And when you yawn, that is going to open up your eustachian tubes. You chew gum, because on an airplane, sometimes you'll have that air pressure changing, and your ears might start hurting. And one thing, if you chew gum, that's going to help you, because it's opening up the eustachian tubes. So don't use that excuse in class to chew gum, because we're at the same. Um, we're not going up in altitude or anything there. All right, the opening of the mouth, you only have one of those. We have one esophagus, and remember that's the tube that goes from the pharynx to the stomach to carry the food, the drink. And then the new place that we're talking about, which is part of the respiratory system, is the larynx, and that's the opening where the air is going to. And you might say, all right, how does it control these substances? When I drink something or when I eat something, how come it doesn't go down the larynx unless you get choked you know if you might get tickled and start laughing and then you get something go down your windpipe and you try co coughing and getting it out that's because it went down the larynx and into your windpipe and it wasn't supposed to go there well god made little things to block these things we're going to talk about the blocking of the larynx when you swallow we're going to talk about it's called epiglottis but i think that's in the second lesson but I want to talk about the eustachian tubes are normally closed, so they're already closed. But what about your nasal cavity? How come when you drink or eat something and swallow, it doesn't go up your nose unless you get tickled again? You can have that go up your nose. And that's that little punching bag. That little punching bag that you have has a purpose, that uvula. When you swallow, your tongue then is helping to push the food back but also the food and the tongue is pushing on the uvula and it goes up and it blocks the two openings of the nasal cavity. And so that's why when you're swallowing food and drink, it's not going up your nose unless it moves somehow and then it can go up your nose. So that's a little tidbit that you don't need to know for your test or quiz. Okay, let's talk about this larynx. The larynx is also called, commonly called, the voice box. It's also, a lot of times on men, it's larger. You can see it move. Um, if you put your hand on your um, 
just under your chin on your neck and you start talking then you feel that vibrating in there and then you swallow and you can feel a bump move up and down well that's your voice box and a lot of times in men because it's bigger and we'll talk about why it's bigger you can see it more readily and it a lot of times is referred to as the Adam's apple same thing that's the voice box that's the larynx and it's surrounded by a lot of cartilage as you can see here so walls consisting of cartilage pieces are held together by muscles and by ligaments and inside of it is your vocal cords now I don't know about you when I heard and was talking you know like an elementary about vocal cords I thought of strings like on a guitar or in a piano that's what I thought they were I did not know they were more like flaps of tissue and so the vocal cords sometimes are referred to as vocal folds and that's what they look like that's a real picture of somebody's vocal cords it's a pair of membrane folds in the larynx and so they're protected by that cartilage uh, you don't need to know this for a quiz or a test but there are two and you can see uh, if you look at the diagram there which are labeled false vocal cords there are two flaps in there that are not what produce your voice but they are referred to as false vocal cords the true vocal folds are what or chords are what produce your voice now think about on a piano what kinds of strings on a guitar a harp a piano produce the low notes the thicker and the longer and then what kind of strings are producing the higher notes those are thinner and shorter and that's how we get the various range of voices that we have singing or talking is from the thickness and the length of our vocal folds men and this is talk about the women first we have thinner and shorter now what that causes then for them to vibrate more rapidly and that's what produces a higher pitched voice now we have different ranges because we have high soprano medium soprano low soprano and then we have alto I'm an alto I'm not al an alto singer I sing low voice I have a low lower feminine feminine voice and so that is what produces it now guys this is why your Adam's apple or why you have a larger voice box your vocal cords are thicker and longer which produces the deeper so somebody that has that real low deep voice that you know mama sang bass dad sang tenor well the mama sang bass or whoever has the bass they're gonna have the thicker and the longer just like on a piano just like on a harp just like on a guitar